Hello world, my name is Monis and today we will talk about the concept of HTTP REST APIs, a topic that is a little bit misunderstood in the field of software engineering. So let's get you a little bit more clarity. All of us use the internet and we are quite well versed with typing in a website address and browse the websites. Some of you might know that these internet addresses are also called URLs which stands for Uniform Resource Locator, where resource is just a fancy name for data. So this resource or data could be anything like a PDF, a web page, an MP3 song, a text file, or even a video. So when you type in the URL and press enter, your browser sends a request to the web address by saying, hey, send me the resource you have on this URL. The website, which is essentially a program running on a computer somewhere, receives the request and responds back with the resource. So if you type in google.com on your browser, you will simply receive a web page as a resource which is visually presented on your browser. Similarly, when you click on a link to download a PDF, you will receive the PDF as the resource. So we can clearly see that there is some sort of communication between the two systems, by which they can exchange the data. Typically, the system which requests the data is called the client, and the system which processes the request and sends back the response is called the server. Now, for this communication to happen, the client and the server must understand each other. In real life analogy, for two people to communicate with each other, they both have to speak the same language. If they both speak English, then they have to abide by the rules of English grammar to create the sentences. If they don't, then their communication could probably fail. For example, the sentences, the cow eats grass and grass cow eats the has exactly the same words. But the latter one doesn't make much sense because it doesn't abide by the protocol of English grammar. Similarly, for a client and the server to communicate with each other, a common protocol is required. One such protocol that the systems can use is called HTTP, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Now this HTTP does a bunch of stuff and one of the most important things that it does is that it defines the format for constructing requests and responses so that the client and server can understand each other. This is very similar to how English grammar defines the format for framing sentences. So if you choose your communication protocol as HTTP, then you have to create your requests and responses using the rules of HTTP for the communication to happen. To understand this a bit further, let's try to see what an HTTP request and response looks like. So each HTTP request contains an HTTP version. There are different versions of HTTP and the latest one is HTTP3. Although this is the latest one, not a lot of systems have adapted to this version. So the most common ones which are being used today are HTTP2 and HTTP1.1. Next, you have the URL, which is pretty much the address of the resource where the request will be sent to and processed. Then we have the HTTP method. An HTTP method defines what action the server must take when processing the request. The HTTP method that is used when you type in a web address to get a website is called the get method because it is getting the data from the website. There are a few different request methods, each of which are designed to perform a specific action. For example, put is used to replace a resource on the server, like an old address with a new one. Post, which has been widely used to submit forms on the internet, can be used to perform a variety of operations like posting a comment on an Instagram photo. Patch is used to update an existing resource. Delete is used to delete the resource on a server, like deleting an Instagram photo. Then we have the HTTP request headers. Headers are just key value pairs and a way of sending some metadata along with the request. This metadata can contain information about who the client was, data about whether the request is coming from an authenticated client, and so on. Some header keys are conventionally used for some specific purposes, but we are free to send custom headers as well. As we discussed before, they are just key value pairs. Optionally, we can also have a request body which contains the data which needs to be processed by the server. Some requests have it, some don't. This body can contain some plain text or some data in key value pairs arranged in JSON format and so on. Another piece of optional data are request parameters. You might have seen something like this in your browser URL. Parameters can be added to the request by using the question mark at the end of the URL and adding key value pairs 
These parameters are useful in a variety of ways, for example filtering t-shirts based on the color black. This is quite a useful way of sending additional data in GET requests because it doesn't have a body. So now let's try to actually send a request to an empty web page and see how it works. So as you can see, the multiple elements of an HTTP request are clearly present, like the version, URL, HTTP request method, and headers. So now that we have understood the concept of an HTTP request and what it looks like, let's try to break down an HTTP response. Now, responses are not magically generated from the server. The programmers responsible for the website must program the server in such a way that it is able to accept the request, process the data within the request, and then construct a response and send it back. So let's see what an HTTP response looks like. So first, we have the HTTP status code. An HTTP status code is basically a three-digit code which tells the client what actually happened with the request. For example, if there was an email present in the request, but the email was not in the right format and looked like this, then the server could return the status code 400 to tell the client that, hey, something is wrong with your request. However, if everything was fine and the server could correctly process the request, it might send the status code 200. Similarly, there are specific status codes for specific scenarios, like 404 if the resource was not found, 401 when the user is not authenticated, 201 when the new resource is created, and so on. So HTTP status codes usually tell the status of the request as in what happened with it. To know more about all possible status codes, I would highly recommend you to have a look at RFC 7231 section 6, link is down in the description. Next we have the HTTP response headers. Just like the request, the response can also have key value pairs called the headers. Some of the keys have a very specific use, but the server is free to send back its own custom key value pairs as well. Then finally, we have the HTTP body. This usually contains the data which was requested by the client. For example, when you request a website from your browser, the page that you see in the browser is actually returned in the response body which is then read by your browser to visually display it. Although having a body in the response is optional, most of the responses usually have it. Now we have created a simple web page which just displays hello world. Let's try to send a request to this web page and try to see what we get. Now we can clearly see the various elements of the response like the status code, response headers and the HTTP body. Now that we are clear on the concept of HTTP request and response, let's talk a little bit about a concept called statelessness. By design, all HTTP requests are stateless. This means that each request is independent of the others. No request is aware of what others did before the current one. Let me explain this with an example. Imagine a request which adds an item to the user's cart. The request could look somewhat like this. Now here, the request only knows three things, the ID of the user, the ID of the product, and the quantity which is added to the cart. If a user runs the request and adds an item to the cart, then the request itself has no information of what happened in the previous request. So the first time you execute this request, the item is added to the cart. You run it one more time, the request doesn't have any information about what this user did before, but when the request reaches the server, the server checks whether the item was already there in the cart or not. If yes, then it updates the quantity. If not, it just adds item to the cart. Throughout this whole journey, the request was completely oblivious to the user state as to how many items are there in the user's cart. This is precisely what we call as statelessness. Now that we are aware of the concept of request, response, statelessness, let's try to understand what exactly is an API. So first, think of a car. A car has accelerator and brakes, among other things. You know that if you press the accelerator, the car will speed up. And if you press the brakes, the car will slow down. You don't need to know what's going on behind the scenes or the mechanics of an engine. Similarly, API is simply a way for a system to expose certain actions which help a client create, read, update, or delete a resource on the server. The client doesn't need to know how this happens. It just needs to know what action it needs to perform and what result will this action ideally achieve.
Since HTTP already provides a well-defined way of communication between clients and servers, the server can expose some resources and the actions available on those resources using HTTP. This is an overall concept of an API. Now, at this point, you must be wondering that this video was supposed to be about the REST APIs, but we continuously talk about HTTP. Why is that? Well, a lot of people think that these concepts about request, response, statelessness, APIs, and all of these things are the concepts of REST APIs. In fact, a lot of boot camps and websites and blogs also claim the same. Well, that is not exactly the case. All these things are actually the building blocks of HTTP and not exactly REST per se. So what exactly is REST? Let's talk a little bit about that. So basically REST is a style of architecture. It is not a protocol, it is not a way of communication, and it is not a standard. The concept of REST, which stands for Representational State Transfer, was coined by a very accomplished computer scientist called Roy Fieldling in his doctoral dissertation. This style of architecture defines five guiding principles in the context of distributed systems. So let's try to understand them. So the first one is client-server architecture. There must be a clear separation of responsibilities. One component is the server, which is responsible for offering services. Then there is another component called client, which is responsible for using the services offered by the server. To use the services, the client issues requests. The server can choose to either respond to these requests or simply reject them. Second principle is statelessness. In the client-server communication, the requests must be stateless. This means that each request should have sufficient data for the server to understand the request without having any information about the context on the server. Third principle is cache. Each response should be able to define whether the contents of the response can be reused by client or not. This helps improve the network efficiency. In the context of a browser, a website can define whether it allows the browser to cache the request or not. If yes, the browser can store the response and can skip calling the server next time the request is made. If not, the browser sends the request to the server again. Fourth is uniform interface. The server must offer a general interface using which the clients can request to perform actions on the server. This interface allows the flow of data through the requests and responses in a standard way. And finally, the fifth principle, that is layered system. This is more about how a server is organized internally. A layered system divides the server responsibilities internally, like load balancing, security, actual functionality, and so on. In today's world, microservices architecture would be a great example for a layered system. So now that we know the guiding principles of REST, let's try to connect this information with the topics that we discussed earlier. So first, client-server architecture. HTTP already conforms to that. Same is the case with statelessness. HTTP is stateless. So for abiding by these two principles, HTTP is a really good fit. Now when we talk about cache, the server should be able to control which resource it allows the client to cache and which it doesn't. The server can add a header with a key called cache control, which can be read by the client or the browser so that they can see whether they are allowed to cache the resources or not. If yes, then for how long? So this principle can also be easily implemented using HTTP response headers. Now, coming to the uniform interface, this principle precisely follows the definition of an API. With HTTP, this principle can also be implemented by the server to allow only certain actions on certain resources in a standardized format. For example, for adding an item to the cart, you have to send the product ID in the request. If you simply send the name of the product, the server will reject the request and the item will not be added to the cart. This standard is the same throughout the millions of users of an e-commerce website. Coming to the final principle, that is layered system. This has less to do with HTTP and is more about how you design your architecture in multiple layers. Layered architecture is a simple hierarchical architecture where each layer uses the services of the layer below it and offers services to the layers above it. For example, within an application, the persistence layer uses the services of the database layer and offers services to the business layer. 
Similarly, this concept can also be used in a microservices architecture where each service has its own unique responsibility. So as we can see, HTTP is quite a good fit for the REST principles and any API which follows these guiding principles is called a RESTful API. So there you have it, the fundamentals of HTTP and REST. Write down in the comments below if you have any questions. See you in the next video. Bis done.